a donkey and an elephant. All right. <clears throat> uh, chapter four deals with forces. Now, so far we talked about kinematics. Now, kinematics is pretty much study of how things move. We talked about how things move. We talked about things moving in constant velocity, which means it's not turning anywhere. It's not changing direction and moving at same speed. Then we talked about things accelerating. Things accelerating at a constant acceleration. And then we had to use those uh, evil equations, right? Those four evil constant acceleration equations to figure out right how things moved but we never really talked about what caused that motion right so from chapter 4 on we're going to be talking about dynamics of physics and you now dynamics pretty much talks about what causes the motion okay we all know um, when things are pushed or pulled Things will either stay at rest or it will move, right? So forces are what's going to be causing things to move, all right? So let's take a look at lesson one, dynamics, all right? Now, dynamics, okay, we're going to talk about, I don't like to use the word why. Like, why? Why? Just no, 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 right? Dynamics is a study of what right? makes things move. Okay. Um, it just makes more sense to think about what causes things to move rather than why. You know. Um, in order to understand some dynamics, we have to understand the ingredients that makes up dynamics, right? Such as mass. Now, mass, besides being a one hour of torture for me every Sunday, right? In physics, mass is the amount of matter that makes up an object, okay? Now, a second definition of mass is the measure of the inertia of an object. So it's important to say mass and inertia are the same things. Now, what is the word inertia? Now, this word inertia pretty much measures not only mass, but it also measures nature's laziness okay and we will talk about this word inertia a lot more in detail but for now just understand that mass is equal to inertia okay all right <clears throat> mass is a scalar quantity which means it has no direction and it is not a vector, okay? It's a scalar quantity. The symbol for mass will be lowercase m. So don't think this m is meters. This is a variable, not unit, right? So mass is represented with lowercase m. The unit for mass are as follows. MKS system means meters, kilograms, seconds. Okay, this is the SI, System International, not Sports Illustrated, right? SI unit for mass is measured in kilograms. This is the one we use in physics, okay? In CGS system, which is pretty much what chemists use, because they play with a sm lot smaller scale, right? And they use grams, right? Centimeters, grams, second is what CGS stands for. But we don't, physics don't use that. Chemistry people do. In British system, right, 
Mass is measured in slugs. Now, this is not the same slug that you'll see out in the rain, you know, right? Where it comes out all slimy, right? Th this slug is probably a different slug because the slug is actually a pretty huge unit. Um, average person will have mass of about five and a half to six slugs. So slug is huge. I believe they got this word slug as like, you know, like a cannonball firing a slug, you know, or, or when you get shot, I guess the slug is embedded in you, right? The slug. So I think that's where that word slug comes from, but fact check me, okay? But concentrate on this. Kilograms is what we physicists use in science. Kilograms is the mass. This is the only thing that matters. All right? So now let's talk about inertia. Now, inertia is an object's tendency to maintain its present state of motion or its present state of rest. It has both parts. If it's at rest, it tends to stay at rest. If it's in motion, it tends to stay in motion. So whatever the object's present state is, whether it's at rest or in motion, it wants to stay that way. Okay, that's, that's the important thing about inertia. Inertia is quantitative. That means it could be measured numerically, okay? So quantitative means it could be measured numerically. Qualitative is slightly different. That's more subjective. But quantitative is more scientific. So inertia is a quantitative, and the numerical value is the mass number for that object, okay? So for physics, that mass number is going to be measured in kilograms, okay? If an object is at rest, it should be at rest, not a rest. The object's inertia is a measure of how much it wants to stay at rest. So... If we have an elephant and a mouse. Now, they're both at rest. Who's going to want to stay at rest a lot more if you were to push on both of them with equal amount of force? Obviously, the elephant, right? The elephant's going to want to stay at rest, and it's going to be very hard for anyone to push an elephant to make it move because it has a lot more mass, which means it has a lot more inertia, okay? Mouse, you could just push that with just one finger, and the mouse will move, and mouse has less inertia, which means it has less mass, okay? So you could write, think about a mouse... And an elephant. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. Um, if an object is moving with constant velocity, so we talked about rest, now we're going to talk about moving. Now, constant velocity is a key thing here. That means it will move at constant speed in a straight line, okay?
So constant velocity means it will be moving at a constant speed in a straight line because velocity has two components to it, right? It has the magnitude and direction. And magnitude is the speed and direction is the way you're going, right? So if an object is moving with constant velocity, the object's inertia is measured how much it wants to maintain its current speed and direction, okay? So imagine a huge asteroid traveling in a constant velocity, right? Well, this huge asteroid, which is the size of like Manhattan, let's say, it's going to want to stay moving in the same direction that it was moving, it's going to take some serious amount of force to change that momentum and change the direction of that or change the speed of it, okay? So that asteroid will have a huge inertia, all right? So we will talk about inertia more in detail when we talk about Newton's laws, okay? And Newton had many laws, but we're going to talk about three laws that he has. All right. <clears throat> now, the final ingredient of dynamics. So, we, so far, we talked about um, inertia. We talked about mass, right? So, we talked about mass. We talked about inertia. Now we're going to talk about force. So this third ingredient, which is force, it is defined as any push or a pull. Right? It is the thing, notice the thing is in quotation here, that causes acceleration. So force is any push or a pull that causes things to accelerate. Okay? Now, it is very abstract concept because we really can talk about force unless we talk about acceleration, right? Uh, we never can talk about acceleration unless we talk about something that causes that acceleration. And force is something that cannot be seen, right? You can't really see force. You can't taste it, right? You can't smell it, right? Force is something that is very abstract. You could only see the effects of force, okay? So, such as acceleration due to gravity. If we drop something near the surface of the Earth, we could see that object accelerating towards the Earth. So we could see the effects of that gravity pulling on it, but we really can't see gravity itself, okay? Uh, another example would be the acceleration on the baseball due to a bat. Well, that you could probably see, but... Right? And acceleration of a car due to friction. This we'll talk about more in detail later, but this is something very counterintuitive, okay? All right. You okay there, Maddox? Yeah. All right. All right. So, here are some things that you should know about forces. So, when you exert a push or a pull on an object, you say you are exerting a force on the object. Okay, and that's very important. So, when you exert a push or a pull, you are exerting a force. So push or pull force. A force cannot be seen. It is only known by its effects on an object. So we could only see the force was exerted when we see the effects of that force. Um, first effect. Forces cause acceleration. Now we talk about this. Forces will cause acceleration. But, here's a big but right here. What if 
a car is stuck in the mud, and a giant monkey. This looks like owl-faced, rat-tailed, bloodshot-eyed monkey. Right? Pushes on this car. But the car does not move. Is he still exerting a force on the car? What's the answer? It's yes or no. What would you say? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. But I thought forces cause acceleration. Well, something must be countering his push. And what is that? Well, he's definitely applying the force in this way. But remember, this thing is stuck in the mud. So the mud is probably pushing back with the equal amount of force countering his push. Right? So, force on car by monkey, force on car by mud, right? These two forces are canceling each other out. That's why it's not accelerating. Okay? So, this force and this force are same amount but in the opposite direction, okay? This is not a paired action-reaction force. Action-reaction force is slightly different, okay? Now, when you push on something, it pushes back at you. So when monkey is pushing onto this car, believe it or not, the car is pushing back onto monkey. Okay, this is action-reaction pair. So when you're pushing down on your desk, the desk is pushing back up on your hand. Okay, that's action-reaction. These two are not. Okay. All right. So let's answer some of these questions. I will let you answer this before we go over it. Let me ask you to answer these. I'll give you about uh, six minutes. Let's answer this. I'm going to pause this. Lesson one, is inertia a force? No. Inertia is a mass, right? Inertia measures the nature's tendency to maintain its state of rest or its state of motion. All right. Number two, if there is no motion, can there be a force? And the answer is yes. See the monkey and the car example, right? If there are two forces acting opposite of each other that has same magnitude, they will cancel each other out, which will produce no net force, therefore no acceleration. And if the object was at rest, it's going to stay at rest. Identifying forces. Up the pull of a wagon, yes. That is a force. The push of a hand, yes. That's also an example of a force. The mass of a nickel is 5 grams. No, it's not a force. Just, just the mass. And what is required for, uh, in order for a force to be present? Any push or a pull has to be there in order to have force. All right. So now let's talk about Newton's three laws. Okay. And then I'll let you guys start your homework. 
So, Newton's three laws of motion. Okay. He had he had a lot more than three, but as far as the motion is concerned, he wrote this Principia, and he pretty much stated all these nice things about motion. And the first law of motion that he stated was the law of inertia. Okay. An object will continue in its state of rest or constant velocity, both magnitude and direction, that is, unless acted upon by a net force. Now, this word net is very important. When you have a job, right, you get a paycheck, usually, and on that paycheck, you have a gross amount that you have earned. And then from all the deductions that you do, from, you know, Uncle Sam takes deduction, your county tax, your city tax, and all that. And then whatever you get left over is your net pay, right? Well, that net is same thing in this case as well. When you add up and subtract all the forces that are acting on an object, and then whatever that remains is the net force, right? Just like your net pay. So the net force is defined as sum, it's the sum of all forces. Now, don't forget, some forces will be in the negative direction, some forces will be in the positive direction, but when you add all those positives and negatives up, it's called a sum, right? So since the force itself is a vector, it's going to have directions. So when you add forces, you're going to have to add the magnitude and the direction of the forces. Okay? So the net force is defined as the sum of all the force vectors acting on an object. The Greek uppercase sigma, this is sigma, right, means the sum of, right? For those of you who saw this in math, the summation, right? Therefore, the summation of all forces, or sum of all forces, sigma f, will mean the net force. So this is how we represent net force. Now don't forget, net force itself is a vector. So I'm usually going to be representing that net force as a vector with that little arrow on top. Okay. If the net force equals to zero, then acceleration must also equal to zero. There's no negotiation whatsoever. When the net force is equal to zero, acceleration must equal to zero. That does not mean it has to be at rest. That just means there's no acceleration. It could be moving at a constant velocity. Or it could be at rest. All right? Now, this is a change from Aristotle's belief that a body's natural state is at rest. Now, Aristotle was like 3,000 years before Christ. And he said, well, you know, Object's natural state is always going to be at rest, right? When a boulder f rolls down the side of a mountain, it's going to basically keep rolling and rolling until it's find its natural state somewhere, and it's going to say, ah, oh, here it is. This is where I rest. But Newton came by and said, no, 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 no. Body's natural state is whatever state it has at that moment. So if it's at rest... That's his natural state. If it's in motion, that's his natural state. So Newton said no. So, question number one. Can an object have forces acting on it and not be accelerating? And the answer is yes. If the net force, right, is zero, right? Okay. 
then all forces add it up equals to zero, right? Therefore, it will not accelerate. So for example, if I have an object in space, and this object has force acting on it this way, right? force acting on it this way, force acting on it this way, and force acting on it that way. And if I add up all these forces, they add up to zero, then it will not accelerate. Again, it doesn't mean it has to be at rest. It could be in motion in a straight line right? with a constant velocity. Or it could be at rest, but it's not accelerating. If an object has a zero net force acting on it, does it mean there are no forces acting on it? An object, well, we just said that. It just means they will all cancel out, right? So, again, all forces cancel out. Therefore, no net force. Okay. All right. That was Newton's first law. Newton's second law states F equals MA. What does that mean? To be fair, it should be said as the net force is equal to MA. All right? So everybody forgets that little sigma a lot of times. The net force is equal to MA. This is very important. He did not come out and say F equals MA, actually. He actually explained it this way. The acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the net force acting on it and inversely proportional to its mass. So he actually introduced his second law as this. The acceleration is directly proportional to the net force acting on it and inversely proportional to its mass. The direction of the acceleration vector will be in the same direction as the net force. So direction of acceleration, same as the net force. Okay? So whichever the net force direction is, acceleration direction will be in that same direction. And conversely, wherever the direction acceleration it has, that is the direction of its the net force. All right, the second law shows from where the units for forces are derived, okay? Since we said the force itself is defined as mass times acceleration, acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. We already know that from kinematics. Now, mass is measured in kilograms. 
So the units for force is should be measured as kilograms times meters per second squared. Well, they decide to give this unit in honor of Sir Isaac Newton, and they call that as one Newton. Okay. So, so, when you see Newton, it means kilograms times meters per second squared. This is the one we will use in physics. Now, of course, in chemistry, they use CGS system, which is centimeters, grams, seconds. So centimeters per second squared times gram is called dyne. Okay. In British system, we use feet per second squared and one foot per second squared times one slug is equal to one pound. Okay, one pound. And pound is LB. That LB and pound, how do they come about? Well, the LB, I guess, comes from Libra, which is like the level, you know, in, in zodiac symbol. So that level and, and, and that the scale that you'll see is how LB came about. All right. Um, the second law also helps to quantify the idea of inertia. So, for example, a force equal to 10 newtons in positive x direction is applied to two different masses, mass 1 being 10 kilograms and mass 2 being 100 kilograms. Okay? A comparison of two objects' acceleration will show which object has a greater inertia. Okay? So, acceleration 1 to mass 1. So, if we apply 10 newtons of force in the positive x direction to mass 1, which is 10 kilograms, this object will accelerate at 1 meter per second squared. But if I apply that same amount of force to 100 kilogram mass, the object will accelerate only at 0.1 meter per second squared. So obviously, this mass 2 will accelerate 10 times less than mass 1, so it has 10 times more inertia than mass 1, right? So it has 10 times more mass. And that's why it says 100 kilograms here and 10 kilograms here. So remember, the acceleration is inversely proportional right, to the inertia of an object. Therefore, mass 2 must have 10 times more inertia than mass 1 because it has 10 times less acceleration. All right. Any questions so far? All right, now comes the third law, and this is very, very confusing, so pay attention. All right. Now, Newton's third law, action, reaction, pair forces. Okay? When an object exerts a force on a second object, so now there are two agents here, object one, when one object exerts a force on a second object, that second object will exert a force back on the first object. The second force will be equal in magnitude, right? But opposite in direction to the first force. So, if you push down on your desk or table, that table is pushing back at you on your hands, right? 
So there are two different agents pushing on each other. Okay? So if I push down on the table, that's the action force, hand pushing down on the table. And the reaction force is table pushing back up on your hand. There are two different separate agents acting on each other. Okay? So, forces always come in pairs. We have to use on and by terms to recognize which one is action and which one's reaction. Okay? So here's the action force. The action force is, if I look at this, force on hand by tray. Right? The reaction force is force on tray by hand. Okay? So force exerted on the tray by the hand. The reaction, the force exerted on the hand by the tray. You could flip this and it'll be still be the same. Okay, depending on which one you want to make action, the other one is reaction. So there's no such thing as one has to be the action all the time. It could be the, you know, switched. Okay, because they're equal. They're same forces in the opposite directions, right? Same amount. So it doesn't matter which one's action, which one's reaction. But just got to have to know how to identify one or the other. Okay. So, the action-reaction force does not act on the same object. That means, people will say, well, if that's true, then nothing should ever accelerate on this earth, right? Well, that's not the same as if I have a football, right? And I'm not talking about two separate forces acting on this one football. This is not action, reaction, pair. We're not talking about two forces acting on one single object. We're only talking about force one acting on second object and second object acting on force back onto first object. Okay? We're not talking about two forces acting on a single object. Okay? Now, where's that force coming from? I guess you could make into a, like, if you want to, I guess you could make it into a, like, a cleat. Right. So we're not talking about two forces, two different forces acting on a single object here. We're talking about, here's a wall, and if I were to push up against the wall, right, that's a terrible hand, by the way, but if I were to push up against the wall, then this is what's wall is pushing onto the hand this way right force on hand by wall and then 
this would be force on wall by hand. This is action reaction pair. Okay, not this. Okay. So it's very important. It's two separate agents acting on each other, not two forces acting on one agent. Okay. All right, so that's very important. So action, reaction, pairs. We're going to talk about this normal force, John, more in detail. The normal force means surface force that is perpendicular to the surface, otherwise known as a supporting force. Okay, So the supporting force caused by this object onto the table right, is this. And the table supporting this object is that these two are the pair action reaction object being pulled by the earth and object pulling the earth right Th these two are action reaction these two are not pair forces these two are and these two are very important Okay, so we will talk about that more in detail. So the weight force is a force exerted on the block by the earth. This is the weight force, right? The weight prime is the force on earth by the block. These two are the action reaction. And surface force which is force on the block by the table, which is the normal force. And the reaction is the N prime, which is the force on the table by the block. So these two are action reaction. And these two are action reaction. The common misconception the weight of the force and the normal force are action-reaction pair, but that is not true. They're often equal in magnitude and opposite direction, but they are not an action-reaction pair. We'll talk more about that in detail. Okay, so I guess I should circle these two in different colors. All right, all right. So, according to Newton's third law, when an object falls to the earth, there is a force exerted by the object on earth, right? Now, the force of gravity is force by the earth onto the object, okay? So, you could say the force of gravity is force by earth on ball. The reaction is force by ball on earth. Now, these two forces have to be equal, right? You could obviously see the force of gravity is pulling the object down, and you could see the acceleration of this as 9.8 meters per second squared. But how come we don't see Earth accelerating towards the ball at the same weight? Well, let's find out, okay? So... Here, 
this is the force by ball right on earth that has to equal to the force by earth on the ball well let's say this ball has mass of like half a kilogram or something like that it's still a heavy ball it's like a one pound or more than a pound right so if the ball has half a kilogram of mass okay we already know the acceleration of the ball and that is g which is 9.8 meters per second squared okay well we know the acceleration of the ball is 9.8 meters per second squared and we already know the mass of the ball is 0 0.5 kilograms so we know the force by the earth on the ball happens to be 4.9 newtons well this has to be also then 4.9 but why don't we see the earth accelerating towards the ball it does but it's so small that we cannot even measure it because the mass of the earth is 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms and the earth acceleration can be calculated but we know that this times the acceleration of the earth has to be equal to 4.9 so what is the acceleration of the earth towards the ball it is simply 4.9 divided by 6 times 10 to the 24th and that acceleration is a billion times smaller than Microsoft Zero. So 4.9 divided by 6 EE 24th is 8.2 times 10 to the negative 25th. Right? 10 to the negative 20 meters per second squared. This is so small. It cannot even be measured. It could be calculated, but I don't think you could measure it because you don't have any instruments that precise to make that kind of acceleration measurement. That's why you don't see Earth going up towards the ball every time you drop something. Okay? So I know somebody's going to always ask me every year, yo, but Mr. Kim, what about like if like every single person on the earth gravitate towards like one spot on the earth and they all jump together at the same time will the earth recoil and the answer is yeah it will it will recoil but how much will it recoil not that much right because if you think about it the mass of the earth is 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms what about all the people on the earth like how many people are living on earth like 7 billion let's make it like 10 billion including all the illegal aliens from different galaxies right and if you say each has 50 kilograms give or take right we have kids we have adults right we have skinny people we have like athletes like right we have running backs and offensive line so average overestimate 50 kilograms right so if we have 50 kilograms right times what 10 billion let's say
That's only 10 to the 11th power. Earth is 10 to the 24th. That's 13 more zeros that Earth would possess. 13. So if we jump one foot, Earth would only recoil one over 13 zeros of foot, which is, you can't even measure that. So it's not going to happen. All right. So here, according to legend, a talking horse, we will call him Wilbur. And because he was a talking horse, of course, Harvard accepted him. And this Wilbur said, well, I went to Harvard and I learned Newton's laws. So I know my physics. And when he was told to pull the carriage, he refused, saying, listen, I went to Harvard and I know my physics, right? Saying that when he pulls on the carriage forward, Newton's third law states the carriage will pull him with an equal force in the opposite direction. Therefore, the force will be balanced, and there will be no net force. Wilbur then goes on to say that since there is no net force, Newton's first law and second law states that it can have no acceleration. Therefore, since it was already at rest, the carriage will remain at rest no matter how much I pull on this thing. So how would you reason with this rather weird horse? Yeah. Yeah. Well, is the horse correct? What would you say? Is the horse, of course, pulling the carriage? Yes. What would you say? Ava? Ava? Um, isn't he wrong? Obviously, he's definitely wrong. Right? Okay. Object, it's two forces acting on like it's two objects correct so they can't cancel out so where is the horse applying the force of course is the horse applying the force into carriage or is the horse applying the force somewhere else the horse is applying force on the carriage and then the carriage is applying force on the horse but it's not canceling out Okay, that is correct, but where must force apply, well, horse must apply the force in order for horse to move forward? Let's say the carriage is not there. Where must horse apply the force? Now, let me give you guys a hint. What if this horse was standing on a sheet of ice? How much can this horse go if this horse was on a sheet of ice? He's going to want to walk, but not going to go anywhere. But if the horse has shoes that can dig into the ground, and the horse applies the force, of course, into the ground and digs into the ground this way. So the force by the horse, of course, is onto the ground. So force by horse on ground and the reaction force is 
the ground, applying the force back onto the horse, of course. Force by ground on horse is the reaction pair. So if the horse is applying the force onto the ground, the reaction force is the force by the ground onto the horse is making the horse go forward. Only thing this horse has to overcome is the friction between the axle and the wheel. And if this is very well greased up, the carriage will follow. And if carriage is empty, the horse's acceleration and the carriage's acceleration will be greater. If this carriage is loaded up, then the acceleration of the horse and the carriage will be a lot less. However, it will move as long as it overcomes the axle's friction. So, it's very simple, really. The horse is really not applying the force onto the carriage. It is actually applying the force onto the ground. And the carriage will just follow. Yeah, it's a classic example of what people would say to Newton. It's like, well, you know, this, is, this doesn't make sense, right? And Newton explained it this way. So imagine if the horse was trying to pull this thing on a sheet of ice. It would not have worked, right? But because there's friction between the horse's hooves and the ground, that is what's making the horse work, uh, walk forward. Similarly... If I had a car, if I had a car, and if my car wheel was on sheet of ice, right? Let's say it's on sheet of ice. So here's my Pirelli P0s, right? It's my double dubs, and my Porsche, right? Well, if this is all iced up, I don't care what kind of Pirellis I have, this thing is just going to spin around and just not go anywhere, right? Because there's no grip. There's no force applied to the ground. However, if this same wheel is on the ground, where it's nice and, right? So if this is ice... This is right ground, or I guess you could say like concrete. Then, because there's a friction between the two, right, it will apply the force onto the ground, and the friction will actually make the car go forward. These two frictions will cause the car to move forward. Without friction, with, with ice, it'll just spin around. You know? Won't go anywhere. Similarly, if I had a tug of war, right? if I had a tug of war between two groups, let's say one group is made up of varsity high school football players. Right? Right? And the other side, I have middle school orchestra. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. I'm going to predict who's going to win this. Why? Because I'm going to put the varsity football team on ice. And on this side, I'm going to give the middle school orchestra, right? 
basically rubberized mat, matted floor, right, with spikes. Who's going to win, right? These varsity football guys, they could be huge, but these middle school orchestra kids, they have the traction right here, and they'll just pull them slowly, right? The acceleration is going to be very slow because they're more massive, but they'll win because of friction, right? Because of friction. The tug of war, middle school orchestra kids are going to win. Because ice, they have no traction at all. All right? So I hope that can help you understand about action reaction pair forces in Newton's third law. Any questions? All right. I'm going to stop my lecture here, and I will let you finish up the homework problems for next time we meet. Uh, they're not that much, so hopefully you should be able to do the next three pages. All right, and we'll go over them next time we meet. So I'll stop the lecture.